This is the story of the Bombardier test flight number 388. On the 26th of July 1993, a CRJ-100 was performing some test flights from Wichita's Midcontinent Airport. Now, if you're familiar with the CRJ program, that timeline might not really make sense to you. The CRJ-100 started flying passengers on the 19th of October 1992 with Lufthansa. So if the plane was already in service, then why were they doing test flights then? Well, this test flight was part of the Regional Jet Performance Improvement Flight Test Program. That's a pretty descriptive name if I've ever heard one. This test program was basically designed to redo most of the plane's initial certification flights so that the plane could have some expanded capabilities. Once the tests were done, Bombardier could submit the data to the FAA and Transport Canada, and then the plane would be recertified. On the 26th of July, the flight test included testing a multitude of things. Things like a new flap setting, a lower reference operating speed, among other things. Since this was a test, the pre-flight briefing was quite rigorous. The crew of this flight was among the best of the best. The captain started his career as an engineer, and then he was a flight engineer, and then he became a first officer, and then a captain. The first officer was also very experienced. He joined the flight test program after nine years in the Canadian Air Force, and he was an instructor and check pilot in the Air Force. This crew was the best there was. The flight crew, engineers, technician, aerodynamicists, they all got together to talk about how the test should be done and how they expected the plane to behave during the tests. As they poured over the data for the flight, it became apparent what they needed to do for the day. And boy, did they have their work cut out for them. They needed to do a steady heading side slip maneuver at the lower reference operating speed with flaps at 8. Yeah, that's a lot of words. Let's break down what all of that means. A steady heading side slip is a test of lateral and directional stability. It is performed by stabilizing your plane at a steady speed and then kicking out the rudder in one way and then using the ailerons to counter the rudder input in such a way that the plane would stay on a constant heading. Why is this useful, you ask? Well, as per a NASA paper that I found, a maneuver like this is very useful in calibrating and validating multiple systems on the plane. On top of that, this test is absolutely essential in getting a plane certified by the FAA. In this test, the more rudder input you put in, the more your nose will deviate from the direction of flight. To get out of the slight slip, you just have to ease up on the controls. Since this was a test flight, Everyone was guessing about the performance of the plane. They knew the stall characteristics for flaps 20, 30, and 45. So they could make an educated guess about the stall characteristics for the plane at flaps 8. So the aerodynamicists told the pilot to ease off on the controls at the onset of the stall warning, or when the nose was at a 15 degree angle. They did not want the pilots to push the plane so far that the stick shaker activated. That was a regime of flight that they did not want to be in. On the ground, the pilots were ready to start the test flight. The captain cycled the arming of the anti-spin parachute. Once in the air, the pilots did some trim tests to make sure that the plane was ready for the test. As they entered the test area, the flight engineer briefed everyone about what they were about to do. The captain and the first officer acknowledged. At 12,500 feet, the captain started putting in some right rudder, the first officer started reading out the beta angles, or the angle of the nose of the plane, to the oncoming air. As the plane neared 12 degrees of beta, the captain remarked, Buffett starts. As they went ahead with the test, the captain added, A little bit of pitch instability. But soon they were at full rudder. The captain started releasing the ailerons, and suddenly the stall warning in the cockpit went off. The CRJ was thrown into a right-hand roll and was almost inverted in seconds. The first officer said, just keep going, asking the captain to not fight the role. It seemed to be working. The plane was almost level again. In the cockpit, the first officer released the chute in an attempt to gain control of the plane back. But the plane was in a right bank again, this time with the nose down 60 degrees. The pilots were doing their best to save the plane from its dive. But the pilots could not save the plane and it impacted the ground and burst into flames. Unfortunately, none of the three pilots on board survived the crash. The crash site was in a field and the plane had been damaged pretty badly. 
the engines had been thrown clear of the wreck. From the wreck, the investigators pulled the jack screws that controlled the flaps. It was at 8 degrees, exactly where they expected it to be for the test flight. Still, no answers on how this test flight went so drastically wrong. The wreck basically told them that the test was underway and that the pilots were trying everything in their power to save the plane before it impacted the ground. Nothing suggested any reason as to why this plane would suddenly come crashing down. It was in perfect flying condition. To shed some light on why the CRJ crashed, they started comparing two flights, test flight number 386 and the accident flight, flight 388. They wanted to know if the drag chute that the plane had could have deployed and caused the pilots to lose control of the plane. They simulated a failure of the hydraulic system that powered the chute system. A failure there would not jeopardize the flight in this way. Even though that this test was not that dangerous, they looked into it to see what the pilots did on the test flight. Looking at the data in the cockpit voice recorder, the investigators knew exactly what had happened. The flight engineers had told the captain that the side slope angle should only go up to 15 degrees of slip. But the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder showed that the captain disregarded that instruction, and with deadly consequences. On the cockpit voice recorder, they could hear the stick shaker going off when the side slope angle was 17 degrees. They should have ended the test right then and there, but they kept going. When the side slip angle was 19 degrees, the captain made the remark about the pitch instability, but he still kept on pushing the envelope. He kept going all the way till they were at 21 degrees of side slip. That is 6 degrees more than what the engineers told the captain. Now, we don't know why the captain kept pushing past the limits set by the engineers, but the weird thing is that no one in the cockpit brought up the fact that they were past 15 degrees of slip to the captain. The first officer just kept reading the angle numbers and the angle of attack. There wasn't really any form of protest from either pilot in the cockpit. Maybe they wanted to see how far they could push the plane, or maybe they were pushing the envelope to get better data for the engineers on the ground. But for whatever reason, they did not stop when they should have, and that cost them their lives. The final report for this crash is quite small, and it doesn't go into the psychological aspects of this crash. But if you have any theories on why the captain kept pushing past the limits of his plane, then I would love to hear them down in the comments. This story is oddly similar to the video I did on the BAC-111 test flight crash. In both cases, the pilots went past the limits that they had been given, with disastrous results. If you're interested in watching that video, I'll have a link for you on your screen right now. But this crew had one thing that could have saved them. They had an anti-spin drag parachute attached to the tail of their plane. This was there to provide some nose down inputs if the plane got into a spin or a deep stall, which would help the pilots recover the plane. From the CVR, they knew that the pilots tried to deploy the chute to help them save the plane. So why did that not work? To deploy the chute, you need three main switch flips. The height lock system must be set to lock, then the system must be armed, and finally, the deploy switches should be set to fire, which would fire the chute. But something went wrong in this case. The parachute was found far away from the main wreck of the plane, meaning that it had fallen off the plane without helping the pilots in any way. But why? The chute system was tested in a high-speed taxi, and it was working before the flight. So why did it fail now? You see, when you set the hydraulic lock switch to the lock position, it hydraulically locks the chute to the airframe, as in, it locks the chute to the plane. But when it's unlocked, the chute is not tethered. So if you were to deploy the chute without setting the height lock to the lock position, then the chute would just fly away in the wind without doing anything. That is what happened here. The pilots flipped the switches in the wrong way, and that took away one of the only things that could have helped them in the situation. The system is designed so that the chute can be jettisoned if the chute deploys accidentally. That system came to haunt them. Once they lost the chute, the fate of the plane was sealed. They were done for. Test flights and test pilots like these are often overlooked, 
But it is thanks to tests like this that the planes that we fly on today are so safe and so reliable. I guess we do owe a lot of gratitude to test pilots. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.